Amen. The Gospel of Matthew, we're preaching through it verse by verse. We've gotten to chapter 5. We're going to look at the keys uh, to being happy. The keys to being happy. One person smiled when I said that. Everybody smile real big. Wouldn't you like to be happy? Isn't that a great thing? Uh, now, now, look at this. This is Jesus' first sermon. And by the way, we dealt with this some on uh, Wednesday nights, actually quite in depth. Uh, we're going to go back over this a little bit and give you the high points of what Jesus was talking about. The first recorded sermon Jesus ever gave is here in Matthew chapter 5. Now, listen to what it says. And seeing the multitudes, well, what's this talking about? Remember the end of chapter 4? Matthew told us about the ministry Jesus had in Galilee. He went teaching in the synagogues, preaching uh, the kingdom of God, and then the Bible says he went about healing folks, all sickness, all disease, all torments, casting out devils, folks that were lunatics. Remember we explained that, uh, that luna means moon, and uh, folks used to think they had moon sickness. It meant all people, <laughs> all people with mental problems... Don't look at your neighbor right now. Everybody with mental issues, Jesus healed them. Folks with palsy, people that were paralyzed. in the, Folks, there's nothing too hard for the Lord to change in our lives. Amen. And so what happened was there followed him a great multitude, Matthew said, from Galilee, from Decapolis, from Jerusalem, from Judea, and even from beyond the Jordan. So multitudes came to the Lord because of his healing, because of his teaching, because of his preaching. And now he's going to give them this sermon. Now listen to what he says. He went up into a mountain. When he was set, back then rabbis actually sat down when they taught. His disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and he taught them uh, saying this. So what's Jesus' first recorded sermon going to be about? His first subject. Listen. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The first Subject that he deals with is this idea of blessedness. It's a Greek word, markrios, which means uh, supremely blessed, fortunate, well-off, happy. Jesus said, happy are those who are poor in spirit. And so, uh, in fact, in your Bible, several times, this same word markrios is translated happy or happier. It has the idea that a person is blessed, they're well-off. And so the very first subject Jesus brings up is this is how you can be happy. How many of you met a Christian need to know what happiness was all about? Anybody know some? Glum and sour and down. I don't understand how you can be saved and so unhappy all the time. Old Vance Hadner used to preach and say, cheer up, brother, it can't be that bad. Amen. Uh, there's reasons, if you know the Lord, to be happy. Amen. In fact, I'll challenge you, God wants His children to be a happy, blessed people with the joy of the Lord. How many of you are attracted to people that are sour and down and discouraged all the time? You ever went up to one of those folks and say, tell me your secret. How are you so utterly unhappy constantly? I'd love to read your book. You'll never find a bestseller on the shelves. How to be discouraged 24-7. Yet I've known believers, believers, that seem that way all the time. Now listen, child of God, you know me well enough to know every day is not a mountaintop. There are days of discouragement. There are seasons of discouragement. But God wants His children to come out of those seasons and to be happy again and to rejoice again. Amen. Now listen. He also talks about the kingdom of heaven. He immediately brings up the subject of heaven. Child of God, this is not our home. Hallelujah. If this is our home, let's set up camp. Let's get all we can get. This is not the final place. In fact, this is a short time compared to eternity. Paul said the sufferings of this present time aren't worthy to be compared with the things that are coming. But if your soul and your heart gets too attached to now, you can become discouraged because there's a lot in now that's not right. Well, thank you for those. That's a truth. I heard them. Amen. I read a while back. Folks, I've gotten to the stage. Any notes I write handwritten on my, uh, you ought to see my notes. My text is very big. And any handwritten notes, I can't even see them anymore. And I forget what I said, and it was wonderful. Amen. 
I read this. Editors of Psychology Today sent questionnaires to 52,000 of their subscribers to determine what makes people happy. Now listen to this. I love this. One guy who sent back his questionnaire and filled it all out, he wrote later and said, I think I am happy, but I'd like to know the results of your survey so I could verify it. Amen. He, he thought he, he didn't really know what happiness was. What makes a person happy? Psychologists have known for decades that even winning the lottery won't make a person happier over the long haul. They say no matter what happens, people simply adapt. Now think about it. If you get a new car, it's great for a while. Oh, I got a new car. Ain't it great? But you'll adapt to that new car. You get a raise. Oh, I've got a raise. After a while, you'll adapt to that money, and then you'll think you're underpaid again. Amen. Whatever happens in your life, how, no matter how good it is, folks, I can prove that. Why? Because rich people always want more. They get a 45-foot yacht. They want a 75-foot yacht. I'd like a 25-foot schooner. Amen. It's evidenced by, by rich folks never have enough. Why? You adapt to whatever you get. That's why I don't ever believe my heart when it tells me if you get that, you'll be happy. I know that's a lie. You'll get it before you get it home good. You'll feel dissatisfaction. It won't be all you thought it was. It won't meet the needs, and you'll be right back out trying to get something else if you live that way. Solomon said the eye is never satisfied with seeing. The ear is never filled with hearing. You will never get enough. Tell your heart it's lying to you when it tells you that. Amen. We adapt to things. I read of a fellow over the past six years. His name is Martin E. Siegelman. He's a doctor. He, he founds and directs the, the Positive Psychology Center at the University of Pennsylvania. I wonder if that's a happy place. He wrote a book called Authentic Happiness, like there's a fake happiness. Authentic Happiness, and he found the key to happiness appears, now listen, this is true, to lie in our internal qualities and character strengths, not in external events. That's true. Because everything Jesus is going to tell us, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those that mourn, blessed are those that are meek, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, amen. Everything he talks about is an eternal quality or character trait that can be in you if you know the king and become a part of his kingdom. Now listen to me, and if these things are true in your heart, you can be happy no matter what life affords you. Amen. Jesus said there's a happiness for those in his kingdom, for those who live according to his kingdom principles. Now, folks, this is not a worldly happiness. What's a worldly happiness, preacher? You know what we believe makes us happy? Abundance. <laughs> Put that up there, brother. Put up the first picture. No, the, go back. Go back to abundance. Did we miss something? I might have missed something. There you go. Um, how many of y'all does that look good? Come on, be honest. That looks good. In fact, let's, let's bow our heads. Amen. No, that, lo that looks good, but this looks better. Put that up there. If one scoop is good, eight scoops got to be a lot better than that. We believe that abundance makes us happy. That if we have more stuff, more money, more things, greater, bigger, larger, better, surely... We'll be happy. You know what Jesus said? That is a lie. In fact, he said in Luke chapter 12, he's, he's teaching many things. And it says in verse 13, listen, one of the company said unto him, he had great crowds. Now listen, everybody that followed Jesus wasn't a disciple. I'm going to tell you, everybody that comes to church ain't a Christian. They may even come regular and not be a Christian. They just come around. People come around for different stuff. Say Amen. And one of those came up to Jesus and said, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. <laughs> Jesus is teaching about life and death, eternal consequence. I mean, big stuff. Some fellow bothers him and says, make my brother share my money. I'll tell you, there's a lot of folks that come around Jesus, but they got different stuff on their mind. You know Jewish law. Jewish law said the eldest son had a double inheritance. All the other children got a, a portion of what was left, an equal portion. So somewhere there's some friction there. We don't know what's going on, but this young man wants his money, wants his inheritance. Look what Jesus says. This is so, he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? 
Now, did Jesus know the right answer to this question? Sure he did. He knew what was going on in their hearts. He could have said exactly what was right, what was wrong. Instead, he said this, why are you coming to me about this? I'm preaching the gospel of the kingdom. I'm telling you eternal truth. You're trying to bog me down in how much money you get. I'm going to tell you what I learned as a pastor. I don't get involved in, in secular affairs with church folks. I'm not going to join your business. Come on now. Years ago, someone got me in one of those pyramid things. Oh, my goodness. And, uh, and I thought I was doing good. You know what I learned? The Lord whooped me good over that. He said, your job is to be their pastor, not a business partner. When they see you, they shouldn't think about how much money you made last month or what you didn't do or what you did do. They should think about the kingdom of God. Amen. And boy, after he whooped me over that thing, I never touch. I, I just don't get in business affairs with anybody. In the, my job's not that. My job is to tell you about God and the kingdom, and, and you need to know the Lord and go to heaven one day. And I want you to prosper, and I want you to do good in business, but that's not my focus in your life. Because I'm going to tell you something. You can have a great business and go to hell. You can drive a Ferrari and go to hell. I'd like to drive a Cadillac and go to heaven. Wouldn't you? Amen. That's a whole other message. Listen to what he, he said unto them. Take heed. Now, he gives them a warning. Beware of covetousness. Jesus says, in these two men's heart, there's, there's covetous involved here. What's covetous, preacher? Well, the Bible says in Colossians 3, 5, it's idolatry. It's unlawful desire for possessions of another. Or it's desires beyond our needs, driven by greed. I'm going to tell you, friend, when you've got enough, you need to realize you've got enough. Well, that was kind of sad but it's true when you've got enough you need to tell your heart heart you've got enough you can only wear one tie at a time brother brother dan's looking for his he left his home he knew what i was preaching on today the 10th commandment said you shall not covet your neighbor's house your neighbor's wife his servants his animals anything that belongs to your neighbor don't want what belongs to another person. Instead, the Bible says, be happy for them. You know, our biggest problem is to rejoice when folks have good things happen. You get a new car. If I'm not careful, I'm eat up with envy. My first thought is, why'd they get that? I deserve that. Someone in your work gets a promotion you thought you deserved. Say Amen. Someone gets blessed in their life that you thought you deserved that blessing. And if we're not careful, our first thought is, why them and why not me? And I wish I had that. Hebrews 13 and 5 says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Don't ever let your lifestyle be one of a lifestyle of wanting what others have. Instead, be content with such things as you have. Friend, you can be happy with what you got. You can be happy with what you have. Now listen, you know why he said that? Because the Lord said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And he says, if you've got the Lord, you can say the Lord is my helper. I'd rather say the Lord is my helper than have a new car. I'd rather say the Lord is my helper than have a best house in the neighborhood. I'd rather say God's my helper. You know what else he said? He said, a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Your life does not be made by what you have and, and all the stuff you've got. My dad used to tell me when I was growing up, he said, son, the more stuff you own, the more troubles you got. The more stuff you got to take care of. James Dobson said one time years ago when his kids were little, he's put together a swing set. He took a whole Saturday. It was one of those old metal swing sets, and he put it together and tightened every bolt. And then at the last paragraph, when he was finished with the swing set, it said, retighten every week. He said, I spent seven hours of my life putting up this swing set, and now they're telling me for the rest of my life I've got to tighten it. Uh, every, once a week, I've got to go out there and tighten everything. The more you own, the more you've got to take care of. The more concerns you got. You know what? Right after Jesus told this, you know what he said? He said a certain man had a farm and his, his land brought forth plentifully. 
He had abundance in his life. You know what he said? He said, I, I'll, I'll build bigger barns and I'll bestow my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have much goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. The Bible said God came to him that night and said, Thou fool, this night your soul will be required of thee. So put that next picture up there. Back in October of last year, I read a story. It was just a headline. It caught my attention, and I, I immediately clicked to it. Two 18-year-old boys in Georgia, one of them had just turned 18, and for a birthday present, his father gave him a Ferrari, brand-new Ferrari. That's about a $300,000-plus vehicle. But at 4 in the morning, the night of his birthday, he's riding down the road at a high rate of speed, him and a good friend of his that was 19 years old, they went off the road, went into some trees. The car burst into flames. You can see the condition. They made it out. They were horribly burnt. The birthday boy died before he even made it to the hospital. And I thought about that. What a glorious day when they gave him those keys. A Ferrari. I mean, you can't get no better than that. I mean, what a present. You know what Jesus was saying? He said, even if you got everything, there'll come a moment when you're going to leave this life. And what will it matter whether you were driving a Ferrari or a beat-up car? It won't have any difference. But I had a lot of stuff. Doesn't matter. You'll stand before God. You'll give an account of your soul. The guy with the big house will stand right by the guy that had lived in the apartment. And they together will give an account of everything they did in this life. Your life's not about what you own. Forgive us, Lord. Now listen, listen. Solomon learned this lesson. Solomon, you know the story of Solomon. God blessed him with great wisdom. He had great riches. In fact, it says when he was king, David, his father, had won so many victories. The land of Israel was greater than it had ever been. There was peace and prosperity for 40 years. It says silver became so plentiful in the land of Israel, it was like a rock on the, on the pavement. I mean, this man was incredibly wealthy. Look what he wrote. Ecclesiastes 2 and 10. Whatsoever my eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. How many would like to go shopping and be able to say that? Wouldn't that be neat just one time? I'd love to win one of them sprees where you can just want whatever my eyes fell on and I wanted. I just grabbed it and put it in the cart. Didn't even think about the cost. Just get whatever I want. That's Solomon his whole life. Let's know what he said. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and all the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, it was vanity and it was vexation of spirit and there was no profit under the sun. Solomon said, I spent my whole life getting everything I wanted and at the end of my life, you know what I felt like? Empty and I was frustrated. In fact, he wrote in one place in the book of Ecclesiastes, once you've been the king, what do you do next? You know what part of the great part of life is? Looking forward to stuff. Man, I, I, when we would plan a vacation, I tell my kids a year in advance. Some people wait to the last moment. I, I tell them, why? Because part of the fun is waiting to get there. Thinking about it. Out in the, yeah, man, we're going to have a time. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We talk about all the details. Why? Because that's the joy. Friend, when you've had it already, where do you look? See, the saddest person in this world is the person that's bought everything, had everything, done everything, and there's nothing else. I still haven't seen the Grand Canyon. Thank you, Sister Pruitt. We'll go one day. Amen. <laughs> Brother Pruitt, you're invited. Amen. We'll have a, we'll head to Arizona. We'll have us a wonderful, ain't it great? Folks, folks, the most miserable person on this planet's got everything they've ever wanted. If they don't know Jesus, and they are desperately empty. That's why folks with tons of money and fame and, and take drugs till they, till they leave this life. Come on now. They got millions of dollars. They go to any store they want, lay down a card, buy anything they want any time, and go back to a motel somewhere and pop so many pills they leave this life. Don't you ever believe the lie that your life's about how much you got. You better leave a little something out in the future to look forward to. You know what I'm looking forward to? Heaven. Amen. 
Ooh, glory to God. I talk, you talk about a retirement plan. Glory to God. Some people say, I'm going to Florida when I retire. I'm going to, go, I'm going to heaven when I retire. Ooh, glory to God. Now, if you've got that joy, I got a five-bedroom house. I got a mansion somewhere. Amen. <laughs> Your house is going to look sad. Amen. We think of pleasure. How many remember this show? Fantasy Island. How remember that? Fantasy Island. Back in 1977, you didn't know it was going here today, did you? Ricardo Montalban. He was Mr. Rourke. And I know you evil TV-watching folks know the little fella. Tattoo. Remember him? He'd get in the tower, and, and folks would fly in. And what would he say, church? Just tell me. Now, if I asked you a Bible scripture, none of you would have known. But the plane, the plane. He would see the families come in. Do you remember the scenario? They'd come in with a fantasy, and Mr. Rourke would always give them this message. You may not like what you get. You may get everything you want, but it might not be what you thought it was. Well, the Bible screams that. Screams that. All you get, all of your soul can just have this. Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, Some women, listen, they live in pleasure, but they're dead while they live. You can have abundance of pleasure and be dead on the inside. You can have all kinds of pleasure and be dead. In fact, the Bible says this. In Psalm 106, the people wanted meat. Remember that? They were tired of manna. The Bible says, and God gave them the request, but he sent leanness into their soul. I'm going to tell you, you can have a, a full stomach and a lean soul. And if you've got a full stomach and an empty soul, you've got nothing. And if you've got a bunch of money and an empty soul, you've got nothing. And if you've got all you want in this life, but your soul is desperately hungry. But I like what he said here in uh, Proverbs 13, 4. The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. You seek the Lord. You, you do it his way. He'll, he'll make your soul healthy. Amen. You know what? When you have a healthy soul, you don't need everything you see. Do you love the Lord? Now listen, worldly abundance can actually turn on a man. Ecclesiastes 5.13, it becomes a fuel for our troubles. There's a sore evil which I've seen under the sun, namely riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. You know what? Too much stuff will do. It'll give you problems. Too much stuff is fuel for pride. Come on now. The more you get, the pr more prideful you get. When my mother-in-law stayed with us several weeks back around the holidays, she was with us for several weeks. My daughter wanted to drive my car, so I had to drive my mother-in-law's car. My mother-in-law's got a, it's a little, it's a fancy car. It's a little Buick. Oh, it's fancy. And my car, um, my car is very slow. If you ever see me speeding, it took me a long time to get there. I'm just going to tell you. It's got four cylinders. The transmission's got a little hitch in it, so I've got to be real careful when I'm accelerating to make sure that hitch don't happen. So I just kind of coast along. You know, Most of the time, when you see me in Rock Hill, I'm gliding. I'm not really pressing the gas. I'm just kind of coasting wherever I'm going. But when I got my mother-in-law's car, whew, I'm, I'm there now. You, you touch my mother-in-law's gas, whoo. And I, I, you know, I wouldn't speed, but I did enjoy going, whoop, whoop, whoop. And, uh, and I was having a blast. And you know what I got? I got kind of prideful. I'm like, Look at this car. You know your heart, because I know mine. It is so quick to turn. It'll put its nose up in the air. Look at me, aren't I? Come on now. You act like I'm the only one, dude. You get a little something in this life, it is shocking how quick you think you're the... I got out of my mother-in-law's car. I walked like this. I didn't know I was doing it. Come on now. I get out of my car. I was very humble. Amen. <laughs> I didn't want people to know that's my car. Amen. I don't know who that car is. That's sad. Amen. I got my mother's car. I'm, I'm the man. I know. That. Yeah, that's mine. I click it from a distance, you know. <laughs> Y'all <laughs> act like I'm full of pride. You just like me. Come, thank you. We get a little something. We, we, we the one. Look at us. Look what I got. Pride enters our heart. The Bible says, Jesus said in the parable of the sower, that the things in this world choke the word out of your life. You'll get stuff, and it'll kill God's word out of your heart. 
After a while, you aren't hungry for God anymore. You're more worried about counting what you got. It's a snare and a trap. It's a, it's a trap for lust. That's what Paul wrote Timothy. He said, riches is the world. They'll become a snare and, a, and you'll lust after evil things. I'll tell you something. When you've got too much stuff, it's almost like a fuel to want more stuff. I heard one preacher one time preach this. The cause of wanting is getting. You know what? It's easy to upgrade. It's horrible to downgrade. Once you get something, my wife's wanted a dishwasher since we got married. For 25 years, she's asked me for a dishwasher. She really has. For 25 years, church, I've held out. Why have you, preacher? Because I know if I gave it to her, she'd get worldly. Amen. And um, Oh, she'd get haughty. Her, she wouldn't have dishwasher hands, and then she'd get prideful. It would be terrible. I'm assuring your way to heaven. Amen. I don't know what that was about, but that was a good one. Amen. Now listen to me. Listen to me. You know it's true. When you get a dishwasher, you get something like that, you don't ever want to go back to the... Come on now. I'm not going back. And you know what happens? The more you get, the more you want. When you can't downgrade, you're surely going to upgrade. Do you believe that's true? It is a fuel for trouble. It is a fuel for trouble. Hear your pastor. Now listen, I want to close out. I am not going to get to where I'm going. But listen to step one. Go to that. Can you go to that? The first key. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there's the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is going to tell us how to be happy. And the very first key he's going to talk about is a poverty of our spirit. Not of our financial state. Folks, there's no, no glory in being without. You hear me? There's a danger to abundance. We see that, but God's blessed some rich folks that know how to handle it. Amen? Paul told Timothy, if someone has riches in this life, challenge them to be of a, a sharing, giving heart, and care for others that they might build up treasures in heaven. Amen? And some people are wealthy, and they bless the kingdom of God. He's not talking about a poverty in the natural. He's talking about poverty of the spirit. What does that mean? He's saying, if I want to get in the kingdom of heaven, if I want to be happy, I'm going to have to realize morally and spiritually I'm completely bankrupt. How many of you know you have nothing to offer God in that realm? That if it isn't for His goodness, His grace, His mercy on your life, you wouldn't be here today for sure. Amen? You couldn't walk one day without His kindness. Amen? I, I've talked to people, it, 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 it boggles my mind. They, they talk in terms that almost like they're to be praised for their spirit. Folks, there is no glory goes to us for anything we are in Christ. That's why the Bible, we song about crowns. You know what the Bible says? When you get to heaven, when you get that crown, first thing you're going to do is cast it at his feet. You know what you're going to do? Your old head's going to tell yourself, you don't deserve this crown. This is totally misplaced. This crown doesn't belong on my head. It belongs at his feet. Why? Because if it weren't for him, I wouldn't have lived one day right. I wouldn't have done one good thing. When we get to heaven, we'll immediately realize and recognize there is nothing that I've done. And we'll toss it, cast it. Get it away from me. Get it at his feet. I don't just... Hallelujah. Now listen, we're going to learn in this. We're going to learn in this. A couple things. I'm not going to do it right now. God hates pride. He hates pride. He hates spiritual pride. He resists the proud. He's drawn to the humble. The moment I realize I have nothing to offer you, God, that's the closest I'll get to him. Amen? Oh, we're going to break that open in a little while. Hallelujah. Do you love the Lord? Put those next two parts up there real quick. Let's close with this. It is to have no means to help yourself. It is to be totally and completely destitute. The idea in the Greek, the word actually means a beggar who's who's so ashamed, he has no way he can take it. He's so ashamed, he won't even look at you. It ain't like he could go out and work for it. He has no abilities, no skills, nothing he could do. Remember Lazarus, who, who was at the rich man's gate, begged for crumbs from the rich man's table, and the dog would come and lick his sores? The same word for beggars used, that's used here. It means he had no ability to help himself. I'm going to tell you, Christian friend, the only way to get to God is to realize you have no ability to do anything righteous in your own. If God isn't there for you, you will not make it. 
I want you to stand with me. Will you do that?